the Battle of Poltava on the 27th of June 1709 was the decisive victory of Peter I of Russia, also known as Peter the Great, over the Swedish forces under Field Marshal Carl Gustav Reinskjöld in one of the battles of the Great Northern War. It is widely believed to have been the beginning of Sweden's decline as a great power, as the Tsardom of Russia took its place as the leading nation of northeastern Europe. The battle also bears major importance in the Ukrainian national history, as Hetman Ivan Mazi presided with the Swedes, seeking to create an uprising in Ukraine against the Tsardom. Prelude Charles XII had led Swedish forces to early victories in North Zealand and in the Battle of Narva in November 1700. However, it would take six years before he defeated Augustus II of Saxony, Poland. Peter I withdrew from Poland in the spring of 1706 and offered to surrender all of his Baltic possessions to Sweden except St. Petersburg, but Charles refused. Peter subsequently adopted a scorched earth policy in order to deprive the Swedish forces of supplies. Charles ordered a final attack on the Russian heartland with a possible assault on Moscow from his campaign base in Poland. The Swedish army of almost 44,000 men left Saxony on the 22nd of August 1707 and marched slowly eastwards. Charles took the field in November after waiting for reinforcements to arrive. Continuing east, Charles crossed the Vistula River on 25 December 1707, then continued through a hostile Mashoria and took Grodno on 26 January 1708 after the Russian troops had abandoned the city. At the time, the Russians had been occupied with a large rebellion of Don Cossacks, known as the Bulavine Rebellion. This revolt was contained in part by the forces of the Cossack Hetmanate led by Hetman Ivan Mazepa. The Swedes continued to the area around Smorgan and Minsk, where the army went into winter quarters. Charles left 8,000 dragoons under Major General Ernst Detlof von Krasow in western Poland. Poor weather and road conditions kept the Swedish troops in winter quarters until June 1708. In July the Swedes defeated Marshal Boris Sheremetyev's forces at the Battle of Holochin and advanced to the Dnieper River. During the spring, General Lewin helped in call and had been ordered to gather supplies and to march his army of about 12,000 men to join Charles's forces. However, his departure from Mittau was delayed until late June and consequently only joined Charles's forces on the 11th of October. Rather than winter in Livonia or wait for Lewenhaupt, Charles decided to move southward into the Ukraine and to join Mazepa, who had decided to rebel against Peter. Peter sent Sheremetyev to shadow the Swedish army. Leeuwenhaupt followed south and was attacked while crossing a river near a small village that gave name to the Battle of Lesnar Yar, losing the supply train and half of his force. In need of resupply, Charles moved towards Bacharin, Mazapa's headquarters, but Russian troops under Alexander Menshikov reached the city first. Anticipating the Swedish arrival, Menchikov ordered the merciless massacre of the population, raising the city and destroying all looting arms, ammunition and food. By the spring of 1709 Charles's force had shrunk to half of its original size. After the coldest winter in Europe in a century, Charles was left with 20,000 soldiers and 34 cannon. Short of supplies, Charles laid siege to the Russian fortress at Poltava on the Vorskla River on 2 May 1709. Peter's force of 80,000 marched to relieve the siege. Upon his arrival Peter built a fortified camp on the Vorskla, four kilometers north of Poltava. While observing the Russian position on 20 June, Charles was struck by a stray bullet, injuring his foot badly enough that he could not stand. In addition, Charles's last hope of reinforcement expired, as the Swedish forces under von Krasow had turned aside to deal with the anti-Swedish Sandomierz Confederation in Poland. 
Between the Russian and Swedish forces the Yakovetsky and Budishinsky woods formed a corridor, which the Russians defended by building six forts across the gap. Peter, in addition, ordered four more redoubts built so the entire system of ten forts would have a T-shape, providing flanking fire to a Swedish advance. Two of the redoubts were still being constructed on the morning of the battle, but 4,000 Russians manned the remaining eight, with 10,000 cavalry under General Alexander Danilovich Menchikov stationed behind them. Battle. Because of his wound, Charles turned over operational command to Field Marshal Carl Gustav Rainsky Old. Four columns of infantry and six columns of cavalry were to form during the night, 600 meters south of the redoubts, intending to attack before dawn in order to swiftly bypass the redoubt system and attack the Russian fort. The infantry was in place by 2.30 a.m. but the cavalry arrived late, having lost their way. Riding forward, Axel Jelenkrok observed the Russians at work on the two nearest redoubts, and rode back to inform Rainsky Old. A reconnoiter by Major General Wilmar Anton von Schlippenbach was discovered by the Russians and the alarm was sounded by the firing of a pistol. Having lost the element of surprise, and without sufficient cannon to breach the fortifications, Rainsky Old consulted with Charles Karl Piper and Lewin Haupt on whether or not to proceed with the assault. By the time Rainsky Old decided to proceed with the attack by quoting, In the name of God then, let us go forward. It was nearly 4 a.m. on 28 June, and dawn was already approaching. The Swedes in Carl Gustav Ruse column quickly overran the first two redoubts, killing every Russian soldier inside them, but by 4.30 a.m., he had stalled attempting to take the third. Lewenhaupt's ten battalions on the right bypassed the first four redoubts entirely, advancing to the back line and, with the aid of cavalry, took some redoubts while bypassing others. Two of Rue's rear battalions joined him, indicating orders were lacking clarity as to whether to avoid the redoubts or attack them in series. The cavalry on the left wing, commanded by Major General Hamilton and an infantry regiment, advanced by passing the redoubts on the left and charged the Russian cavalry, forcing them to retreat. It was 5 a.m. where the left and right wings of the Swedish army had made it past the back line of redoubts, sending the Russian cavalry in retreat. However, Rainsky Old ordered his cavalry to stop their pursuit, and ordered Lewenhaupt, already advancing towards the fort, to withdraw to the west. There they awaited Ruse battalions for two hours, while the Russian cavalry and Ivan Skoropadsky's Cossacks waited to the north, and 13 Russian battalions deployed north of their camp in 10 to the south, anticipating a Swedish advance. General Ruse and six battalions became isolated attempting to take the third Russian redoubts. After suffering severe casualties from several assault attempts, Ruse led the remaining 1,500 of his original 2,600 men into the Yakovetsky woods to the east at 6 a.m. The Russians reoccupied the first two redoubts and launched a two-pronged attack by ten regiments around 7 a.m., forcing Ruse to retreat towards Poltava and refuge in an abandoned fort by 9 a.m. when he could not make it to the Swedish siege works. Ruse was forced to surrender his command at 9.30 a.m. The Swedes continued to wait for Ruse's troops to return, unaware of their surrender. As time went by Peter led the 42 battalions of Russian infantry, 22,000 soldiers, into an advance out of the fortified camp, supported by 55 three-pounders plus 32 guns on the ramparts of the fort. Ten regiments of dragoons formed under LT. General Adolf Frederick Bauer on the Russian right and six regiments under Menchikov on the left. Just west of the camp, the Russians were faced by 4,000 Swedish infantry, formed into ten battalions with four three-pounders, and Kreutzer's cavalry in the rear. The Russians slowly moved forward to engage. According to Charles and other reports from other Swede officers, 
The weather at that time was already very hot and humid with the sun obscured by smoke from the Russian cannon in the fort. At 9.45 a.m., Rainskjöld ordered Lewin Haupt and the Swedish line to move forward, advancing towards the Russian line, which started firing their cannon at 500 meters. When the Swedes were 50 meters from the Russian line, the Russians opened fire with their muskets from all four ranks. Advancing to within 30 meters of the Russian line, the Swedes fired a volley of their own and charged with their muskets and pikesmen, and the Russian first line retreated towards their second line. The Swedes seemed to be on the verge of a breakthrough, and needed the cavalry under General Kreutzer to break the Russian lines. Unfortunately for the Swedes, Kreutzers and the other cavalry units were unable to reform completely and in time, with the Russian line longer than the Swedish line. The Swedish infantry on the left flank lagged behind the right and finally threw down their weapons and fled. As the Swedish right flank was still advancing, a gap began to open in the Swedish line which the Russians filled and the battle turned into a Canet variation. Barely able to gather his cavalry squadrons, Kreutz tried to advance on the right flank, but the Russian battalions were able to form into hollow squares, while Menshikov's cavalry outflanked the Swedes and attacked them from the rear. At this point, the Swedish assault had disintegrated, and no longer had organized bodies of troops to oppose the Russian infantry or cavalry. Small groups of soldiers managed to break through and escape to the south through the Budishinsky wood, while many of the rest were overwhelmed, ridden down, or captured. Realizing they were the last Swedes on the battlefield, Charles ordered a retreat to the woods, gathering what remaining forces he could for protection, including the remnants of Kreutz's detachment. The Russians halted at the edge of the woods and their artillery fire stopped. Only the Cossacks and Kalmucks roamed the plains south of the woods. Emerging from the woods at around noon, Charles on horseback after his litter was destroyed and protected by a square of a couple of thousand men, headed to Pushkaryouka and his baggage train five kilometers to the south, reaching it after 1 p.m. by which time the battle was over. Charles gathered the remainder of his troops and baggage train, and retreated to the south later that same day at about 7 p.m., abandoning the siege of Poltava. Lewenhaupt led the surviving Swedes and some of the Cossack forces to the Dnieper River, but was doggedly pursued by the Russian regular cavalry and 3,000 Kami auxiliaries and forced to surrender three days later at Perevolokna. On 1 July, aftermath. High-ranking Swedes captured during the battle included Field Marshal Rainskjöld, Major Generals Schlippenbach, Stackelberg, Hamilton and Prince Maximilian Emanuel, as was Piper. Peter held a celebratory banquet in two large tents erected on the battlefield. Voltaire assumes Peter's reason for this, in raising a toast to the Swedish generals as war masters, was to send a message to his own generals about disloyalty. Two mass graves contained the Russian dead 500 meters southwest of their camp. Previously defeating Peter, Charles had gone so far as to pay the Russian troops. Peter instead took many Swedes, with great pride, and sent them to Siberia. Charles and Mazipa escaped with about 1,500 men to Benderi, Moldavia, then controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Charles spent five years in exile there before he was able to return to Sweden in December 1715, during which time, even handicapped, he retained his magisterial calm demeanor under fire, fighting his way out of several situations. The high vizier of the Turks was eventually paid off, much intrigue and espionage involved, plots within plots at one point involving a ransom of the Russian crown jewels, according to Charles's prison translator. Popular culture. The battle was portrayed in Poltava, a poem by Alexander Pushkin written in 1828-9 in the opera Mazeppa by Tchaikovsky. Recently the battle was also portrayed in the 2007 Russian film The Sovereign's Servant. The story of the battle, told from the point of view of a dying soldier, is related in the Al Stewart song, The Coldest Winter in Memory.
On the 2012 album Carolus Rex, Swedish power metal band Sabaton has a song named Poltava, detailing the battle.